Thank you for being here this evening. We are going to spend the entirety of our night in the book of Proverbs. The title of my lesson this evening is Solomon's Wisdom on Money. Now there are a lot of verses within the book of Proverbs that's gone to tell you about the fact that we are to watch out for those that are poor, help those that are poor, uh, that if we are taking care of the poor, that uh, we are doing what God wants us to do. But I just want to uh, tonight look at some very basic things about money and how we ought to look at it and how we ought to think about it in our life as Solomon has presented that to us. Scripture reading just a few moments ago coming from the 8th chapter verses 17 through 21 is speaking from the standpoint of wisdom being personified. And what it simply is telling us in those verses from 17 through 21 is that if we do really love wisdom and we really seek to find wisdom, that one of the rewards is riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. And he says that the fruit of wisdom is really better than gold. So it's not all just about the money, but that is one of the side effects that you get when you strive to find wisdom. Now when we talk about wisdom, as it's being used here in the book of Proverbs, that's having skills for everyday living. And part of everyday living is about how we are going to handle the income that we do have. Part of that idea behind that wisdom is following what God's design is for us in life. And certainly part of that, and he's going to deal with that on numerous occasions in this book, is avoiding those things that are immoral. So if we do those three things, then there will be wisdom that's coming into our life. And Solomon is saying that if you'll do that, that there is reward that comes to you. In the 17th chapter and in verse 16, Solomon says there, Of what use is money in the hand of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? Now, I will try to give you some illustrations of several of these verses that we look at this evening. <coughs> Excuse me. The thing that really came to my mind when I thought about this is I think about how many college kids go to college and spend thousands and thousands of dollars and in reality are not interested in getting an education. They've got a whole list out there that tells you what is the best party in the school. Success rate's not too high there. Because in reality, they're not interested in getting that wisdom, learning some trait that will help them through life. And in the process, there is a tremendous amount of money that is wasted away. The second thing I want you to think about with me this evening is honesty and money. About three different verses that I want you to think about along this line. The first one is in the 10th chapter in verse 2. Is ill-gotten treasures are of no value, but righteousness delivers from death. Ill-gotten treasures. I stop and I think along that line. Suppose that this morning that you looked out in our parking lot and you found the most expensive car that was out there and you decided to steal that. And somehow or another, luckily, you got home and you hid that thing in your garage. Could you bring it back next Sunday, come in driving and say, look what I got? Couldn't do that, could you? If you stole the Picasso painting, could you hang that on your living room wall? Well, the only way you could do that is you never have another soul coming to your house. Ladies, if somebody were to hand you a very, very, very expensive necklace with a big old diamond in the center of the thing and told you, well, I stole this, but I wanted you to have it, where would you want to wear that thing? You wouldn't, would you? Ill-gotten treasures are of no value. We need to realize that very important fact and make sure that we work for the things that we do have. The 13th chapter, verse 11, says, Dishonest money dwindles away, 
but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. They are those in this day and time that will extort money from other folks. What's going to happen to that? It's eventually going to disappear. There are those that by lying and deceiving that are taking money and income from other people. Solomon is saying it's going to disappear. We find that there are people that will literally cheat their workers out of their income and not treat them right. In the end, it's going to cost them for doing such a thing. A very important statement, though, is the last half of that. He who gathers money little by little makes it grow. So out of each paycheck that you have, take a sum of that money and set it aside, and over the course of time, you'll see it grow. In the 21st chapter in verse 6, Solomon says, A fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. Think about how many people that you read about that have got into some type of a scheme through the lying tongue and they have taken tremendous amount of money from other people. It may work for a while, mightn't it? But eventually it catches up with them and eventually that money disappears. Most likely they're going to be spending a great amount of time in jail. Solomon says the result of this is that that money is going to disappear like a vapor. You see it, and it is gone. And he also says it's like a deadly snare. Now, a snare is what you use to trap animals with. And it is a wire, and there's a round circle there that has a little device on that that when they put their head in there, they start struggling, and what that does is tighten it and tighten it and tighten it and tighten it till they choke themselves to death. Solomon is saying... That's what's going to happen to you when you get your money in a lying way. The third thing I want you to see is there are some proper attitudes that we need to have about money as well. Chapter 11 and verse 4, and there are several verses that give us this thought, people seem to think that money, wealth, is the answer to everything. The psalmist says, Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. I would ask you that if you are sitting in a city and there is wealth that you have, what good is that going to be when a conquering army comes at you? It's not, is it? What good is money going to be in so many situations where there is someone that wants to harm you? Can you pay the money and say, well, this makes everything right? No, more than likely, they'll still go ahead and kill you and take the money. When you do things that are wrong, will money keep you out of prison? Well, let's answer it like this. It shouldn't. Now, I suspect there's a few times that maybe something like that happens, but it, it shouldn't. It's not going to save you from that. The day of wrath that he's talking about is times that can be a life-threatening disaster that comes your way, or it may be the day of financial ruin for you, and on those days he says it is worthless to you. In the 28th verse of the 11th chapter, same chapter, whoever trusts in riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. So where is our trust supposed to be? Trust supposed to be in God. Not in money, not in the wealth that we have. The 18th chapter, verse 11, he says it along this line. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it an unscalable wall. I've got so much money, I am secure. Nobody can do anything to me, nobody can harm me. I've got enough people employed to protect me whatever you may be thinking along that line, and Solomon says, wrong. You may think that it's going to save you, but the truth of the matter is it will not. God can bring you down. People can bring you down. It is not an unscalable wall. Here's a very important warning to us as well. Chapter 20 and verse 21. An inheritance quickly gained at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. 
When I read that, one of the first thoughts that comes to my mind is the story of the prodigal son who says, Dad, give me my inheritance. And in that story, he did that. And how long did it last? Not very long. He did not appreciate what he had whatsoever. And it says that he wasted it all in riotous living. He was brought down. He found himself in the pig pen. I want you to think about what happens to people that win big money in lotteries. If you've never read a lot of those stories, you ought to. It's very eye-opening. There are so many people that have been hard-working people, maybe been able to accumulate a little bit, maybe living from paycheck to paycheck, and all of a sudden, here comes that big payout. What's life like less than five years later? It's gone. So many times, the husband and wife have divorced. They have given things to their kids, and the kids have wasted it, those things. They have bought extravagant things, and the next thing you know, they're filing for bankruptcy. It is rare to find someone that all of a sudden that large sum of money drops into their lap to see that indeed they do what they should with it. I read even just this afternoon about Mike Tyson, world champion fighter a few years back. He made between 350 and $400 million during his career. How much he got now? Nothing. In the year 2003, he declared bankruptcy. Spent millions here and millions there. Sometimes these athletes used to be one of the quarterbacks up in Tennessee that he made real good money and the guy that was managing his money stole a lot of it. It was gone. It's gone. And so we need to make sure that we appreciate what we do have and we use it properly. Chapter 22 and verse 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. Did you hear that? A good name is more desirable than great riches. Several of our Proverbs have been talking about about immoral ways to go about getting your money. The best thing is to get yourself a good name. A good name is to be esteemed better than silver or gold. Truth is, there's a whole lot of things in this life that are more valuable than money. Do we have to have money to survive? Absolutely. But your family's more valuable than money. Your friends, your good health, salvation, your faith, your integrity, being content, using your time, all of those things are far more valuable than money. Now there is a value to money, and it is necessary in our society, but there are things that are far more important than it. And one more underneath that category as well. And this is chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, and I, I like this one real well. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. The first phrase, I've seen that numerous times in my life. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. And the first congregation I preached at there was an elderly gentleman when I got there he was still there when I left 10 years later but that man had worked in the oil fields and there were times that week after week after week he would be gone from home and maybe come home for a day or two and then go somewhere else he was making good money for that day and time and he provided very well for his family during that day and time. But it came the day that he retired and he picked up a little lawnmower business and, and worked at that. But he's looking back over his life and he realizes, and I saw him cry tears many times, I wasn't there for my family. Now, he had boys and girls and all the girls remained faithful to the church. 
And all the boys took off, wanted nothing to do with it whatsoever. He blamed himself for that as well. Whether that's the truth or not the truth, I do not know. But he says, I just was not there, and I missed out so much. Are you spending time with your family? Are you watching your family grow up? Are you spending time with your spouse? Or are you chasing money so much that you're ignoring those that are closest to you? Solomon says, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Another thing that he talks about is borrowing money and loaning money. Now the first thing I would say to us is that the Bible does not forbid borrowing. But it sure doesn't encourage it either. The question would be to ask yourself, am I buying things that I cannot afford? When you are going into debt, you are pledging part of your future away. You're saying that I am buying something now, counting on making money in the future and taking part of that money in order to pay this debt. And in reality, is that not what a credit card is? Now, credit cards are necessary in this day and time. But I will tell you that the way I use my credit card is I buy something knowing that my money is there. In fact, most of the time, within that day or within that week, I go ahead and pay that thing off. I haven't given any money in interest on a credit card in years and years and years. Now, I realize that there are things in life that many times that you're going to have to take that loan out on, especially something like a house. The question is, do you have a good way of making sure that that is covered? Now, what happens so many times is that we ask somebody to help us out in a situation like that. And I look at this, that there is a difference between today and back at that time. At that time, it was one man that was going to uh, take care of you loan-wise. Today, it is a corporation or a bank or something like that is going to be watching out for it. But the first thing I would say is it is a debt you have taken, whether it is to that one person or to that bank. It is a debt that you have taken and you have said, I will pay it back, and it is your responsibility to pay that back. Solomon says in chapter 22 and verse 7 that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. You serve the man that you took a loan from. And it doesn't happen this way today, but at that time the man could have said, it's time to collect it. I want it now. Jesus had a parable just like that, didn't he? The man says, I call the dead in. And he said, I don't have it. And he didn't have it. And he had had to work probably more than one lifetime to come up with the amount of money he was in debt. You are a servant to the person you have made a loan from. There's also a warning about co-signing. Co-signing, the reason that you co-sign is that there is a person wants something and that is true that they do not have the money to pay for it and so they want to do that. And by and large, it is also a person that is at high risk. In these verses that we will look at, it's often referred to as surety. I will be the person that co-signs this and if this person does not pay, then I will be the one, I will be the surety to do that. So you are taking an obligation to pay later without a certain means in order to pay. Chapter 11 and verse 15, Solomon says, He who puts up security for another will surely suffer. But whoever refuses to strike hands and pledge is safe. You've got to be very, very, very careful about getting in a situation like that. Chapter 22, verses 26 and 27. Do not be a man who strikes hands in pledge or puts up security for debts. 
If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched out from under you. And that's the truth of the matter. If you co-sign and you put your name on there and you don't have a way to pay for that thing, then whatever debt is owed can be taken from you. Your very home can be taken from you. And yes, the very bed you sleep in can be taken from you. And there you are without anything. So Solomon is warning to be very, very wise about what you do in a situation along that line. And then he wants to talk about some, about the idea of loaning. In chapter 28 and verse 8, He who increases his wealth by exorbitant interest amasses it for another who will be kind to the poor. Now the truth of the matter, as far as the Israelite nation was concerned, they were not to charge interest to the fellow Israelite. They could charge it to a foreigner, but not to a fellow Israelite. Because the truth of the matter is that God gave them that land in which they were in. But here is a warning that I'm going to get rich because this person is poor, and I'm going to make this interest off of them. There's a warning that it's not going to work out very good for you. There's a couple of things I want to point out as far as the misuse of money. In chapter 13 and verse 7, I suspect that you can, all of us can, someone, or think of someone that was into this category. One man pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. We've all read stories down through the years where someone dies it seems like they had nothing between you start going through all the possessions that they have you find out in reality they had a tremendous amount we've all seen people that act like that they are poor and they might have the biggest house and the fanciest car and you, you think you know, how can they do that? Well, the truth of the matter is they're so far in debt that they really can't do that and shouldn't be doing that. So there are people that will try to fool you along that line. The poor will always try to make their self look better than what they are. Those that are rich, one of the reasons they don't want to let their uh, money situation to be known is that, well, somebody might ask me to give some of that away and I just don't want to do that. So you find various reasons why people react that way. Chapter 21 and verse 17 is, a, I think, a very important one for our day and time. He who loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and oil will never be rich. Now, when we're talking about the wine and the oil, that was going to be part of a big feast they had. More than likely, we're talking about olive oil, which also could be uh, changed into a perfume that people would have used. So we're talking about things that the rich would have. Well, I think about wine. I read, again, just this afternoon, that an average bottle of wine can sell between two and three hundred dollars a bottle. I can't imagine that. Rosemary and I haven't watched Shark Tank in quite a while now. We really used to enjoy that, but the billionaire that was on there, I've heard him say more than once, I won't buy a bottle of wine unless it costs at least a thousand dollars. Can you imagine that? A bottle, I suspect drinking in one setting, and a thousand dollars gone. There are lots of ways, not from the wine and the oil aspect, but I think about all the money spent on sports this year. One of my favorite ball players is making thirty-five million dollars this year, and the team says, "Well, I don't don't really have 35 million, so will you take 22 million this year, and then we'll spread it out in the future years to come?" Where did that 35 million come from? People walking through the gates. You got hobbies that can be very expensive. Think about 
the amount of money spent on music and concerts and things like that. Think about vacations and the amount of money spent on those things. Now, I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. But if you don't have the money to do that, and if you are borrowing money to do those things, you're not wise. How are we using our money? Someone has said it's not the high cost of living, but it is the cost of high living here in the United States. And there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of folks will not say no to their desires and their pleasures. So he who loves pleasure will be poor. Whoever loves wine and oil will never be rich. Then there are some blessings that are associated with money. Blessings can bring wealth. Blessings from the Lord. I am not about to stand up here and say that everybody that becomes a Christian will become rich. There are people preaching that here in the United States right now. They're telling you that. In fact, an article I read just this past week that there is a famous preacher that it says, one of the things that's holding the Lord Jesus Christ up from coming back the second time is that you're not giving enough. If you all just start giving a little more, he'll come on back. Nowhere does Scripture say anything along that line. And yet that's what's being taught. The Scriptures do say the blessings of the Lord brings wealth, and He adds no trouble to it. Wealth can be a gift of God, but quite often with the way that people use wealth, it turns out to be a curse. We like to think that our wealth comes from our human achievements. But if the Lord didn't give you a good mind and a good pair of hands and a good pair of feet, would you be making that that you're making? The truth of the matter is we can do nothing without God's help and blessings, and we need to realize we need to thank Him so very regular for what He does for us. I like chapter 13 and verse 22. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That's grandchildren but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. So if you are a good man, that is a righteous man, a godly man, that there can be by accumulating things little by little, much left for your children and grandchildren once you're gone. The 15th chapter and verse 16, better a little fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Yes, there are blessings that can be associated with it. But it is very important that we look at it properly. I want to conclude tonight with a prayer found in this book. It's in the 30th chapter. And I really believe it is a prayer that needs to be prayed individually in this day and time. And he says, Two things I ask of you, O Lord. And do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of God of my God. My neighbor that I told you a little bit about recently in a, a lesson, it's one of the things that he did tell me once he got to Africa, is I am afraid that the United States are letting wealth become their God. And that wealth has just knocked the true and living God out of the picture. This man prays, just give me what I need today. I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be poor. There are problems associated with both, but just simply take care of me this day. And Jesus taught us to pray along that line, line also. Give us this day our daily bread. And so here are some things that the wisest man had to say about money and some things that I think we need to remind ourselves about from time to time. 
just a moment, we're going to stand for our invitation song. If you've never become a Christian and you realize that you need to, you want to, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, why not come before us and confess His name, repent of your sins, and be buried in baptism so your sins will be washed away, and you'll be part of the Lord's church and have that promise of that heavenly home. If we can help you do that, come as we stand and as we sing.